Welcome everybody to Radicalized Truth Survives. I am Heidi Sigmund Kuda and High Fidelity and I are bringing back our friend Monique Kamara, a geopolitical analyst uh, coming to us from Italy. Uh, we're gonna be widening the lens on how we look at all of the wars and active measures that are currently happening. Oh, I'm so excited to see Monique Kamara with us today. We are very, very grateful to have you. I think you and Zarina Zabriskie are probably our two most frequent guests and that shows <laughs> That just shows what fabulous taste Radpot has and really strong <laughs> warrior goddesses. Um, Monique, super happy to have you. Uh, we were kind of calling this widening the lens. I don't think there's enough uh, widening of the lens when people are looking at the various uh, global operations and action that's occurring. So, But I'm also calling this Coffee with Monique. <laughs> because I just want to have a nice conversation among friends, and uh, yeah. I, I find our, our we're always so happy. Is tea okay? I have tea. <laughs> tea is yeah. fine. Actually, uh, I have water. I I, I uh, forgot my espresso upstairs. Uh, Drinks so. with Monique. That's what we're calling. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Libations with Monique <laughs> Kamara. Um, so uh, let's just jump right in. We had uh, four things we were going to discuss, but I would actually like to bump everything and talk about your War Comes to Campus reporting um, that you just did, a very, very important uh, investigation by you that focuses on what, what I think many people are timid to talk about in America because they still want to believe that everything's organic, that we're in control mm. of our own actions. And much of what we see, of course, is organic, but if we are not looking for the exploitation by those who would like to continue to assault democracy, then I feel like we're not doing our jobs. Can you talk yeah. about what you're seeing in Italy in relation to protests? Yeah, thanks, Heidi. Yes, in fact, um, it was quite this whole, let's say, all of the protests that we're seeing now uh, come at a culmination, uh, let's say, in time, because they started, I would say, um, the groups here in Italy really started, and we talked about this, Snow in Your Green Room, uh, really started with the truckers, then a lot of those groups morphed, and what we're seeing now is basically groups that had formed in February of 2022, um, expressing, getting organized, and then beginning, okay, the anti-American, anti-NATO, anti-Ukrainian, uh, let's say, positions, and bringing those forward in order to curtail armaments and support for Ukraine. Um, those groups, and I think, we well, you talked about this too, Heidi, uh, perhaps quite uh, when that was actually going on, I called them micro protests because these were small groups on the far left. Okay. Because that was um, my focus at the time. They were also the ones that were getting a lot of visibility on telegram, on uh, social media. So that's why they caught, okay. My attention. Yeah. And uh, what we're seeing is that basically these are groups that have now switched from the Ukraine, okay, narratives that they were putting out, and they've gone over to the Israeli and no Palestinian conflict. So this is what, okay, what we're seeing there. Um, these are, let's say, groups that, as I said, are on the far left. What we're seeing, I was shocked to see the word autonomous, which you need to know is something that a throwback of 1968 here in Italy, when there were um, about 134, not about, 134 far-left, communist-leaning, small micro-groups that were forming in universities principally in the north and northeast of Italy. The first groups, for example, had formed in, um, in Trieste, and in Milano and in other okay, university cities. And then these groups basically, um, you know, they began, they were radicalized at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Now, in order for this to happen, uh, this is where, let's say, all of the study that I had done you know, in the past, I was doing 
uh, a deep study into the roots of terrorism. And this, this actually takes hold in a society if there are certain conditions, okay? Uh, one of them being the perceived condition, the perceived malaise, okay, of younger, okay, a younger cohort. So what we're talking about, 18 to 24, okay, uh, grouping. So there, there's, it's, but it's simply a perception. Now, in Italy in 1968, it wasn't a perception. There were huge problems. The government was extremely corrupt. There were economic problems, housing problems. The universities themselves were supposed to house maximum 5,000 students. And basically, in 1968, Italy had a first-year intake of 1 million students. But anyway, getting back to what we were talking about, basically, there's a perception that the authorities are not taking care of business. They are not, okay, um, meeting the needs, all right? And that's how these groups get actually radicalized. That's the, let's say, the, the, the terrain, okay, where they can stick. So this is what we were seeing. Now, um, why in, in the piece that I wrote, which is just a very first, it's a first attempt, there's lots of information that we still have to look at, um, we still have to look at, for example, each of these groups, where they're based, uh, and more than anything else, where are they getting their funding? Because they seem to be extremely organized, okay? That's the part that really gets me. They have slogans, they've got literature, they are organized. In And remember, each group may even have their own kind of organization, which also reflects what was going on in 1968. So they could be... Uh, organized in, let's say, a central committee with different branches. We don't know, okay? This is all stuff that we have to look in. And also, as I said, where are they getting their funding? Initially, it was two groups that I was looking at. They were based in, um, in Milano, Rome, and Naples. And this is where we saw most of the activity. And... Um, they also had, there were two unions, two student unions on the far left, okay, where they say right on their Facebook pages, by the way, I'm not just saying this to, to, to brand them, they call themselves communists. So this is, okay, this is their thing. So they're all sharing the same kind of slogans, the same slogans that we're hearing in the United States as well, across campuses. Um, in the, one of the posts, as you can see, one of the groups has already, Cambiare Rota, has already, okay, um, hooked up and shown solidarity to Colombia. Uh, so this shows that, and they also say, right, in their literature that I've been reading, uh, this is an international movement. So it shows they, some co coordinated links. Yeah. Oh, between yeah. And this the, is, so yeah. One, one of the gentlemen that you bring up, uh, Robert Fiore, who's a member of a far-right oh, yes. extremist group. Now, he's very yeah. interesting because, uh, you know, you show that he's been very active on V-Contact and you also uh, show that he's also been very actively posting about Russia's great power status as the destroyer of the American system. And then he suddenly makes the switch to drumming yes. up support for Palestine. And again, yeah. what we see here, because we yep. have an election coming up, is we see a lot of mobilization to deflect from the issues that young people mostly care about or often care about, which is environmental concerns. And we know that uh, Joe Biden has done more for the environment than any president, but that's not the messaging that we're hearing. The messaging uh, that is that is the loudest is all about what's happening post-October 7th uh, in the Middle East and Gaza. So yeah. what, what can you say on that? Because again, mm -hmm. HiFi's taught me to look for those red blinking lights as a network analyst, and I see a lot of the blinking lights right now. Yeah. Actually, I'm glad you brought that up because um, this caught my eye. It was the latest Pew Research that has been done on what issues, which issues are dear, okay, to university students, um, to the younger, okay, uh, voting, voting cohort, and what they're concerned about is the economy, housing, inflation. Those were the top three, okay? Um, I can tell you that in foreign policy, Israel came in uh, in 13th place, 
Ukraine is not even on the map. They're not concerned with foreign policy at all. They're concerned. And you know what? You know what, Heidi? This even makes sense. If you're young, you're at university, you're investing in your future, you're looking towards your future and how you're going to get into society and, you know, develop your career. You're not thinking of, you know, foreign. All right. So a lot of what we're seeing is also overrepresented. Right. With uh, in the press. Why is it overrepresented? Because, as you know, Heidi, you've been in the business. What leads drama, sit ins, police who are right, arresting protesters, um, the slogans that they're chanting, the divisiveness that's going on in these campuses. And we need to look also, because I haven't read one article yet, and this is, you know, this is something that I'd like to do. And if anyone has, you know, some sort of article title, something that I can read, I haven't read anything on the actual protest organizers at all. They simply focus on the fact that, okay, um, these young kids, they're, they're focusing on what they're saying, the slogan, but they're not focusing on who it is. And as we know, when you're doing research, the very first thing that I ask myself is, who is this? Where do they come from? Where, how, do, how are they supporting themselves okay, in this? Uh, and I look at all these things because it makes a difference. I know here, because as you, you brought up Roberto Fiore, who is someone who is out there, um, supporting anyone with a pro, okay, pro Kremlin position, and we know that he's received money. I've read it in two or three books, okay, that has been documented from no Kremlin sources. So you know, if he's supporting this, if he's supporting, let's say, uh, the protests that are going on in Naples, then you know my antenna goes up. In his case, I think, Heidi, more than anything else, it's just he's feeding off of, okay? I'm not sure yet because I would have to see, okay? Yeah. It's, it's not something I'm, I'm going to say flippantly. High five, uh, jump in because I know what you're thinking. Yeah, yeah. Well, here's my is, question for you. Yes. Are they putting up websites and raising funds online for their little protest movement? Yeah. Uh, also, right. we have we have some of the same we have some of the same like QAnon hanger honors grifter yeah. operatives uh, yeah. muscling in on that. And I think you're right. I think that they may just be vampires coming in to take a lot of them. Of this. Yeah, I mean, it happened with Ukraine. We know that, right? There are certain groups that you know uh, began to say, okay, this is a money making operation, uh, something that we can make money off of. Um, what what we what I did see is that there are at first there were these smaller as I was saying Cambiare Rota and other little small student unions, then all of a sudden on their literature all of those logos disappeared and an association popped up. I went into the association, and uh, it's now under a national association, which on their website has no address. There's nothing. There's nothing for me to look at. So I'm going to have to do some, you know, deep digging there and see who are these people. And the website itself is set up as all of the other websites I've seen that are, let's say, um, manufactured. They're not, yeah. you know, it's not, a, it may not even be a real association. I'd have to actually call them or send them an email. Correct. Hey, you know, what's, what's going on? But their focus is um, uh, gathering funds for Gaza, okay, to, um, I think it was something to do with, um, something to do with either like water or um, trees or something like that. It was a green, there was a green. Yeah. Uh, Some environmental. Yes, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the olive the trees. I've heard much exactly. about that from young people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of saying, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, let's see if we can provide funds for new leaders, for example, that are in, right in the West Bank and also in Gaza, yeah. instead of, you know, the Hamas terrorists that are there now. Yeah. Uh, and also, let's say, just humanitarian aid or whatever. 
No, these guys are looking at trees. And I just sat there and said, okay, this is just something to, to um, let's say, attract, yeah. right? Westerners who are yeah. thinking of trees, which yes. is not a bad thing, but no, I don't it's think not. But we're seeing the way that, that empathy and concerns can be weaponized. And I just want to yeah. thank you Perfect. so much for the bravery of your work because we still here are so timid about looking at the hard realities that I mean, I wrote about uh, you know, an indictment a few years ago where a Kremlin cutout was paying organizations on the left and on the right in order to make us war against each other and weaken us. Yeah. That was the Ianov indictment where four Americans have now been arrested for working for the Russians to exploit these divisions. And I feel if we do not look to see this, we can go back to 2016 and go back to the protests that were funded by the Russians. If we look at the person who built the cage that the Hillary Clinton actress in prison garb uh, you know, was wearing, that yeah. was funded by the Russians. If we do not take a hard look at who benefits from this stuff, whether or not uh, we're concerned about offending people who actually have real empathy for these real tragedies, yeah. it's like yeah. we just have to do the work. So I'm very glad yeah. everybody can find that article. Uh, yeah. at the kamara.substack.com uh your your incredible europhile reporting and from that i think because time is running out already this is all this is why i call it coffee with monique because we can just gab uh i absolutely want to go on to uh one of the most important things that happened recently mm. in america which headlines have already disappeared but we just mm. passed aid long and hard fought, you know, this this fight to pass aid to Ukraine. What does that mean to the boots on the ground? Can you speak on that? Mm -hmm. Since that's one of your areas. Well it means aid. it means getting getting material, okay, weapons, um, shells, whatever is necessary to the front line where they are in dire, dire need. They were in dire need about, let's say from February to the end of March, things were running very low. Uh, they need to beef up certain areas. They focused along the whole front line. We know that the most vulnerable area right now is Kharkiv in the north. Um, it's been explained to me that up in that north, and it's probably that area there where the Russians would have easy access down into Ukraine. So this is the kind of thing. We also know that um, there are issues with rotations and you know, um, and gathering manpower because that's you know, the, uh, extremely important. They, we also know that uh, a lot of the material is necessary for internal defense. And when I talk about this, I'm talking about protecting transportation hubs because they were being attacked Okay, during the winter, very little has been said about this, but there's an article that came out uh, yesterday about this. They've made it public now, but they've been, uh, the Russians have attacked, and this is part of warfare because we know that, you no, know, if you're going to do strikes, it's not just the civilians in the terms of Russia does this. It's not right, obviously. It's uh, against international law to strike uh, civilian targets. Uh, they do strike transportation hubs, defense, okay, industries, all of that. The transportation hubs I'm talking about are the ones that are closest to the borders of Romania and Poland. So that's where they've been striking, okay, quite a bit. That needs to be beefed up, okay? I mean, if it were up to me, I would send in, for example, a contingent of NATO, okay, uh, uh, personnel to act as, uh, let's say, for the defense inside of those areas, taking care of things that, you know, the Ukrainians are using manpower in these areas where they could transfer that manpower to the front. But that's what, okay, this is extremely important that the United States, thank God that this stuff, okay, got through. Um, Europe, uh, I think through the initiative that was the Czech initiative, they've managed to secure uh, a million shells. This was extremely important. They will be delivered in tranches, so it won't be all at once. 
And so this is what we're looking at. We're also looking at the development and this technology is important. There's lots of little things, okay, that, you know, because there's a lot of material that's necessary. Yeah. Um, the, the whole development of drones, okay, that would save manpower, save lives, and yet do damage. Now, the Russians um, could probably go at this another two or three years, okay? So this is what we're looking at realistically, okay? Uh, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because they probably have in their, um, we know that they have the Sovereign Wealth Fund, okay? They still have money there. They're still getting money from oil and gas sales. They're probably getting any different, like all of the, let's say what they need in terms of armaments, technology, that's all coming through, no, third, okay, third party sources. We still haven't curtailed that enough. Um, so the Russians can keep going, and remember one thing, this is this is extremely important because people say, oh my God, there's 450,000 Russians who no, uh, have uh, their, their casualty numbers, right? Which was were just estimated. The last estimate came from the, uh, the UK defense uh, intelligence um, uh, report. Uh, that doesn't matter to them. Actually, the more they, the more Russians that die, the more Putin can put up his little memorials all over the place, okay, and turn this into, because they're a militarized society right now. So for them, losing, okay, men, doesn't matter, right? We know that they don't care. And actually, the more the better. Okay? Isn't, that, isn't that insane? Something, well, for us, it is. For them, yeah. Yeah. you know, they can put up a memorial. They can say, look at all these men that have sacrificed their lives for the motherland. In this addition, is how they spend it, right? Also, I've been yeah. binging uh, Timothy Snyder all weekend, just hour after hour after hour of Timothy Snyder's interviews. And he said it's yeah. also uh, why they traffic women and, and children out of Ukraine. It's like they're, yeah. you know. Gonna... No, and that's, you brought up something that's very important. This is why these, this material that's going over. Uh, we know, for example, came out the the um, the British Defence Minister, Minister of Defence, uh, Grant Shapps, also uh, disclosed that Italian uh, sh storm shadows have been you know, sent over. Uh, that the Italian government didn't make public. He did, and we're very happy about that. Applause, applause. Why is this stuff important? They've got to get them out of the Black Sea area. One thing that a lot of people don't realize is that the Russians controlling, okay, that area there means that they can use it for all of their illegal traffic, human armaments and drugs. Remember, a lot of this stuff is being most likely funded through drug trafficking and illegal, okay, other illegal means. So um, in the north part of the Black Sea, I can tell you about a year ago, they were controlling all of that area. And uh, this is, you no, know, this, this is a strategic, a geostrategic, okay, area. So um, the, this funding, the funding, no, but let's say the armaments that are going over, Heidi I, and Hi-Fi, I can't say enough how important they are. Um, the more that Ukraine can withstand, and defend and push back, uh, the safer everyone is. Right now, they are the ones defending Europe. It's as simple as that. There's also another thing, is that um, in the United States, we saw that there was a fire in Scranton in one of the arms industries. They're going to be increasing that. Internal, okay? Uh, the same thing is happening in Europe. We have spies all over the place. Thank goodness now they're starting, okay? Uh, in Germany, six spies last week were arrested. Uh, we know that, okay, these spies were connected to the Wasn't AFB. one of them like an assistant, an assistant to an Oh, MP? yeah, no, there was. Oh, the, uh, look, Hi-Fi, there's... We, fact, we, need to reserve, we need to reserve a little bit of time to talk about the spies because that's very important. Uh, you know, I, I have a theory that in Europe, they uh, call them spies. In America, we call them lobbyists. And I, I really think that's a... <laughs> That's a freaking problem. Now, but, two um, other points, two other yeah. points, and then we can move on. One is also, uh, just take a look at the nationalization of uh, companies that is now taking place in Russia, um, right. domestic and foreign. 
they just, I think, four companies yesterday that they uh, um, they manufacture appliances, one of them an Italian manufacturer, by the way. But we shouldn't be looking at this. We're with our team. We're looking at this in another way. The nationalization serves two purposes. One, to find personnel that they can recruit or rather just, you know, gather up and send to the front. Because there's a lot of companies in Russia where they have a 10%, uh, let's say, of their staff have to go to the front. So if they've taken over this, then uh, they gather, let's say they have the, um, let's say, the manpower and resources, okay, of these companies. Nationalization is never a good sign, okay? Never a good sign. It means things are really going south. Um, but they can still hang on. I'm telling you, they can hang on for yeah. another maybe two or three years. The other thing is the surprising arrests that happened. The deputy, okay, uh, Minister of Defense, uh, Ivanov, all right. Uh, there were two others that were arrested on the same day, again from the Ministry of Defense, and the FSB did a search in Abramovich's uh, museum. So that we're looking at and we're Ooh. going to see. So there's a... Exactly. Now, there's a huge, um, as I was saying, just in, another point is uh, the labor shortages. There's a good article that came out in the Moscow Times. When you are reading the Moscow Times, by the way, don't read the English version. Go read the uh, Russian version and translate it. Mm -hmm. The stories are different. Okay. They're simply different. So that's what we're talking about there. What needs to be done? Um, basically we got to, we have to make sure any action that we can take to curtail, uh, the Russian capabilities, it's as simple as that. And there's lots of them that we could do. So, uh, we have yeah. to make sure they don't get hands on technology as they yeah. did. And they have been Russia done. has to be defeated. The best way that Russia can be yeah. defeated is to yeah. support Ukraine. We know this yeah. high fidelity, uh, yeah. you, you jump in. So one of the things I'm interested in, if you know much about the fall of the Soviet Union, you had these different yeah. factions within the country, right? You had the military, you had intelligence, and you had the mob, which is the oligarchs and the businessmen, right? Are we seeing that same kind of fracturing in Russia today? Are they uh, breaking apart on these lines based on these arrests? Yeah, I'm not sure, okay, exactly uh, what, let's say, what all of this means, okay? Um, in, the, when 19, in the 1980s, they had already started preparing for the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, they were looking for money. They had gone, um, you know, they had to cover all sorts of, um, all sorts of loans, that they had taken out. They were constantly, constantly on the lookout um, for funds to keep the country going. Okay, this was in the 1980s. So we know uh, they hit up, they tried to hit up the New York bond market. That didn't work. Uh, the Europeans, about three different countries actually bought up bonds. Anyway, um, it, it's, they had already started, right, Hi-Fi, around 1986, that's when they started carting out billions of dollars from Russia and implanting them in the West. Okay, we know that. So uh, right now what we're looking at is probably um, trying to place people who are loyal, okay, and who are in line with the Kremlin. Um, they may have to make some, some mafiosi very happy. But let's just remember that, I mean, Putin's regime actually incorporated the mafia in the regime itself. We know that his dealings in St. Petersburg, right, were all, all right, he was, he was, you know, importing cocaine and all sorts of, it was a drug trafficking, illegal, everything, okay, coming into, uh, coming so into. So you have the mob and intelligence working together, but you still have the oh, yeah. military separate. Oh, no, they incorporate them. They incorporate yeah. them all right the in. It's all just That's one it. big mob. Yeah, yeah. Just a mob. It's all, they've basically, look, it also happened in the Italian state, okay? What happens is that you may have, let's say, a generation where they are deemed mob, 
okay? Their kids, their kids go to university and then they are absorbed into the state, but they still come from mob families. Yeah. So this is, it all looks very legal. Like I know, right? They send their kids to university. They get them all whitewashed. They're all yeah. you know, institutionalized and they are absorbed in the state, yeah. right? We have to look at it sort of, you know, in, in, in that way. That's the way I look at it anyway. Yeah, no, it's so, so smart. One, one, of, the, the one of the... Yeah, it's, the, the, the infiltration over here. the generations. Well, that's the whole thing. They send their kids out. They get yeah. educated. They go yeah. abroad. They yeah. make connections. They set up yeah. networks. They yeah. come back, and then yeah. they are the mayor of the town. Then yeah. they become uh, counselors of the region, and then they go to the government in in uh, in Rome. So it's you know they, it, it, they the it's just, has a representation. You just mapped out, you know, one of the munitions manufacturers who uh, was involved in a oil company here, an ethane company here, uh, energy company here in America that leaked money out to uh, GOP operatives, you know, had a son who was in college here volunteering for the Trump campaign. And it just don't stop. Uh, for the next couple of minutes we have left, I want to talk about that theme of spies versus lobbyists. Yeah. There are there are sp Russian spies being arrested as we speak. Unfortunately, as I say this, yeah. you see more headlines on on the perfect distraction, which is a a, a horrible thing. But a as the Russian spies are getting arrested, journalists mm -hmm. are getting arrested in Russia, and I can't help but see the correlation there. It's like, oh yeah, you know, tit for tat. So in yeah. any case, yeah. we talk about some of the spy arrests because yeah. again, in uh, America, we still pretend that we're not even infected. <laughs> operatives? Yeah. What operatives? There are no operatives here. We're so bad um, at dealing with actual treason, to quote Michael McKay. We are so bad at dealing uh, with actual yeah. treason. Oh, yeah. Well, that's mm -hmm. all, you know why? Because then you have to admit that there may be people internally, domestically that are helping them. And yes. that's a suicide. So that's why it's, you know, it's easier... To, to put it frankly, it's easier to, you know, catch a spy, let's say, and, and then the problem is, is that, okay, you can catch them, but then they have connections internally, right? So, um, you know, those get exposed, right? So this is, this is a, a big, huge problem there. Um, the two countries that were featured this week, uh, the UK, there were two um, that actually, there were six of them. OK, there were two uh, UK um, uh, nationals. They're suspected of arson, uh, two men, and also for providing the Russian intelligence services with targeting okay, uh, information. So this is in the UK. At least they caught them. And there you go. In Germany, another six spies, the one that HiFi that we were talking about before we came on, um, there was a German citizen, okay, who was born in China, but then became uh, a German citizen, and he's accused of spying for China. Guo is his name. He was parliamentary assistant. This is what you were trying to get at, Hi-Fi, to Maximilian Kra. Okay, now Maximilian Kra is a EU parliamentarian, and he's the lead candidate for AFD. Okay. Now, uh, 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 I'm uh, sorry. I'm sorry. It's like no. It's like now, it's just so badly caught. written. These are such badly written. Hold on, hold on. Let me see if I understand this. So what you're saying? That's both. A foreign right? intelligence it's operative. Mm -hmm. A foreign intelligence operative infiltrated and weaponized a far right political party in a country to cause chaos. Is that what you're saying? Um, these, now it depends. In this case here, this is someone, okay, who is working for the Chinese. Guo was working for the Chinese, okay? Um, all of these guys, all right, that either get, um, that get recruited, all right, in order to do, okay, spying for China or for Russia, what are they interested in? Okay, they're interested in documents, 
passwords. I'm talking about what the Chinese and Russians want. Ah, uh, what they're trying to get. They want access, okay? They want access. They're not looking, by the way, it's not like they're going to go to the top person in a party. They're going to look for people who have access to documents, passwords, technology, right? They want all of this kind. They want policy decisions. How does Germany view China? What are the next steps? They're trying to get as much intelligence as possible, okay? And then through these people, obviously through this Maximilian Kra, for example, um, he was batting for China, all right? Now, he's been on, on radar, for example, the FBI grilled him last year when he came into the States for New Year's Eve, and they grilled him, okay, on, uh, on that kind of thing. Um, there's also Kra's number two, and this is maybe what you were thinking of, is Peter... Uh, Bistrin, and he is accused by Czech investigators of having taken right twenty thousand euro for okay operating a pro-Russian disinformation operation. Okay, and this is this was the one for the Voice of uh, of Europe, and no, everyone's looking at the Voice of Europe on YouTube to see exactly who, right? They they brought on so on and so forth. So it's this kind of thing. Now, there is a difference, let's say the Chinese, uh, because this is also something that is going on as well. Um, and, you know, they're, they're, a big play, and they're a big player when it comes to what is happening in Ukraine, right? So this is an, this is an important thing. Uh, the aims, basically, of uh, the Chinese interference operations have to do with gathering information more than anything else. Uh, their target, of, especially on the views of China, as I said before, and then they try to influence the way that China is perceived. And how do they get EU politicians to do as China wants? They go through the major economic players. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, right, and the, the Russians do almost the same thing. They use these people to get as much intelligence as possible, but they'll move through other, okay, proxies, other players in government uh, in order to influence, okay, the government. So they may, th uh, through major economic players, associations, lobby groups, and all that kind of thing. Wow. So uh, they got nabbed. They got nabbed. So what's so that's interesting six, to me, uh, six this is of them. Wow, Monique. Yeah. I, I'm looking at the alleged spies in Germany, and they're accused of working to undermine the military support provided to Ukraine. And and we just talked to uh, Michael Weiss was on the show a few weeks ago from Russian right. Insider. There yeah. are multiple examples of this. And I feel like as somebody who kind of grew up during the Cold War, that we really need to talk about the spies and infiltration yeah. more than we do just isolate it over here, isolate it over here. No, this is part of a larger pattern to undermine the post-World War II democratic world order as we move uh, closer yeah. toward autocracy. And I don't know a another way to, to, to explain it. Yeah, no. Well, I mean, look, this has been going on after after the Second World War. It started right away. Yeah. So it picked up. There were certain times they sort of, you know, stop for a little bit and then they pick up again. No. Um, and we're in, we're in an we're in an the one, again. Yeah. Now, the one thing that is extremely important for the Russians and the Chinese is technology. And this is where our industries that deal in even our academic research that deals with technology, the development R&D, that has to be especially protected. Okay. And this is something, I mean, I, it's shocking to me that in up until about, uh, let's say, well, until the Soviet Union collapsed, um, they got most of their their technological, let's say all their technology, the, the designs, everything from the States yeah. through, okay, stealing this stuff. Yeah, right. right? Yeah. And now you have British universities that up until last year, I think it was either Cambridge, if I'm not mistaken, were working directly with the Iranians. Yeah. So now the Iranians have, okay, this technology for drones that they probably used. I don't have proof for that, but they probably used it to, to okay, to attack 
uh, let's say those drones went over to Russia and then yeah. those drones were used to attack Ukraine. That's so, right. I mean, that kind of stuff really needs to be curtailed, okay? They should not be giving away, you know, our research and development, which yeah. costs billions, all yeah. right? These are these are things that need to be protected. And that's what they're after most of the time. They wow. want stuff that they can copy because they don't invent. They don't have the the resources to be able to do this stuff, right? Yeah. So this is where it's extremely important. Oh my gosh. So we have we have a president who considers the hybrid warfare going on a distraction, right? He's not addressing it. He's just whatever. Uh, are there any politicians in Europe who are like, mm. yo, this is Russia and China and Iran and they need to stop because this yeah, is unacceptable? Yeah, they're starting to. They're starting yeah. to. Uh, yeah. Up until, let's say, about a year ago, I think things started to turn around seriously after Macron's statements. Uh, there's been a bit of a shift also because they've noticed that for the European elections, um, it's extremely there. It's extremely important to get proper information to voters. Uh, I'll have just a fun fact that uh, that I found. There are, for example, more. There's there are 28 far right parties that are standing up for the EU parliamentary elections. I don't know about the far left because remember Russia will go through those. Yeah. They'll try to find people peppered all over the place, yeah. okay? Where they you know they um, they can influence and yeah. then you know, knock on your door later. Because remember, it could be that right now they they sort of a, it's a soft approach, yeah. and then they know that they have that person there that they can access to get information. Equal As opportunity said, infiltrators. Uh, that's, you know, they may not use them right away. Yeah. That's another thing. They could be dormant for 10 years and then all of a sudden you get a knock on the door. Yeah. You know, that, that's what I find so fascinating about some of the politicians on the left that have been infiltrated. You don't see it right away. And then all of a sudden there's this huge, you know, pro Russian stance on something. And you're like, where did that come from? And, and that is a very good point that it may not be something that's revealed immediately. Last bit, because I know you have to go. I'd like to make coffee with Monique a regular feature. What do you think, Hi-Fi? Yeah? <laughs> I'm okay with that. That'd that be good. so great. We got to do this. We got to do this like, uh, you know, every couple of weeks, if not more. Um, I, I do have one more thing, though. Can you uh, kind of tease out to our uh, viewers uh, all of the deep dive that you're doing on uh, patterns mm. of terrorism and concept yeah. of nonviolent resistance? I'd love you to kind of... Yeah. Uh, and people Just, can, again, read more at Europhile, kamara.substack.com. Thanks, Heidi. Thanks for mentioning that, by the way. I really appreciate that. Oh, um, my God. I I, you know I don't go to bed until Europhile comes across. <laughs> my, I, I'm up around midnight waiting for Europhile so I can see what's been happening around the globe, in Europe, in Ukraine, and also all the beautiful cultural details that you put in, like the woman who was playing Led Zeppelin on that beautiful instrument. Yeah. Like, I live for that. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I go, I'm an aggregator, right, for certain things. But then I'll just, I, I try to pepper in a little bit of commentary to give it some context. Let's just put it that way. Because, I mean, news is news, right? Anybody can go and check to see what's going on. Um, what can I tell you? I'm now doing uh, a lot of, let's say, research, real research into the roots of terrorism and how it grows and stuff like that. So... I had to go back, I, I began going back to um, the work that was done on the terrorism that was born in Russia uh, before the turn of the century, because that's where we find, okay, the actual seeds of terrorism. Uh, the terrorism we're seeing today that we call Russia terrorist state, well, you know, that's it's pretty much, you know, they've been using the exact same tactics. Um, and and that kind of thing. So that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at a report, two reports that were written um, for a subcommittee um, for intelligence in the United States. It's a one report is from 1978, another one is from 84, 85. But I'm looking now into all of the literature that is surrounding all the different terrorist acts and what brings them. Okay, what actually creates them? Um, they can't 
terrorism doesn't grow where a society is resilient that we know so what we were talking about before even you know before coming on the whole uh resistance uh, like i'm reading right now the resistance operational um concept okay which is two things one is how do you build resistance resilience in a society so that that this radicalization and terrorist groups cannot okay they don't have oxygen in order to grow all right that's one thing and the other part of it of course is you no know, the military itself and our federal governments take care right of that kind of thing but these are nonviolent measures why am i mentioning this you, because Mike. The whole concept, okay, of um, nonviolent resistance that we need to have in our own societies, this is resistance against a new form, or rather the gray, the gray zone form of warfare, which is economic warfare, uh, psychological and political warfare. We're talking about any kind of weaponization of anything that's there, so that societies can already okay begin to resist these okay these kind of measures that you no know, are hurled because we often think of war and we say oh my god yeah well all those poor people that are getting hit okay yes all right we know that in ukraine right the people are 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 being killed um in our own societies what is happening and we're not paying attention to that part so this is where i'd like to go Right. Uh, but I need to have first a very, very solid base. And I've already started. That's where this article that I had written about um, the, this is what scared me when I saw a lot of the protests because they are so um, similar to the proto terrorist groups that I'm studying and I'm looking at from 1968, but also from the years before. Brilliant. So that's where, that's where, this is why it scared me. That's why I wrote the piece because I Brilliant. said, oh my God, there are just too many similarities. Now the differences are that um, we have a much stronger economic base. Okay. But it is the perception, unfortunately, it is the perception that is being thrown out there through propaganda and all sorts of psychological and political, um, let's say, operations that are going on to show that things are just just terrible in the United States. I, I don't believe it. OK, no. I honestly don't believe it. The economic factors are telling us things are OK. You were talking about investments that are going in into no uh, green yeah. Exactly. There's all sorts of great things yeah. that are happening. The indicators tell us that's not true, but yet the perception is different. Um, so yeah. this is, you know, yeah. this is the I, difference. Thank you so much for your work, Monique. I cannot wait to have you back. I just, I, you know, more Monique, please. Thank you, Monique Kamara. Thank you. Thank you.